It hasn't been the usual, well, I don't know about, there have been some days, but it really doesn't feel like February anymore. No. <clears throat> it doesn't. I don't know where this month has been going. All right, we get an extra day. And mm. that day is the South Carolina okay. primary. <laughs> South Carolina primary, really? Yep, on leap day. Interesting. And what a perfect uh, <laughs> segue into the movie. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Did you do that on purpose? No, but I am generally pretty good at pulling segues out of nowhere. Yes. Well, is that our official start of the show? <laughs> I, I, think it, I, think it, I think it is. I think it is spoken. You are Vanessa and I am Darren. And yes. we have accidentally started the VD Clinic podcast episode on. Am I saying, on, it? Uh, saying it? The Daughters of Dust, or Daughters of the Dust, and Zora Neale Hurston's Every Tongue Gotta Confess. Yes, yes. I, I don't know. You know, Darren has this bad habit of just recording, and then we'll be talking and talking, and then all of a sudden... We'll be in the midst of our conversation. <laughs> like, oh, fancy to see you here. Yeah. Just, just strolling through our conversational woods. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, that was, I guess that was a segue into the, the movie, um, Daughters of the Dust. Do we have anything we want to say? Do we run and get right into the chat about the movie? Um, because I feel like now there's been really no segue. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, I know. Yes, I promise, folks, we've done this before. They went to Savannah, but uh, I mean, yeah, South Carolina. The well, so so the movie we're talking about is the 1991 movie Daughters of the Dust directed um writ well directed produced um uh, written by Julie Dash and it won cin best cinematography actually um the art came out at Sundance and it's one of these kind of independent films. Um, well, first of all, I want, before we get into the movie and the, just, I wanted to bring up the, something to point out. Um, since, I mean, this is Black History Month, we wanted to do, to highlight some um, film and, uh, you know, directors and uh, writers, uh, African American or of African descent, and uh, because I mean, we not that we haven't done that before, but I think this is a, this is a great time to do that. And I've been wanting to talk about this movie for a while. I've been wanting to talk about this book too for a while. So, um, just kind of fortuitous the way that they came, but. This is one of those pieces of independent, uh, what did they call it? Like, it was that same kind of like when Spike Lee was kind of starting to, there were other African-American filmmakers. 
there was like this whole uh, wave of them that came out of like the independent cinema kind of phenomenon that was starting in the like late 80s and, er, you know, early to mid 90s. Uh, and so, and Julie Dash was part of that. And this film, I've always heard about it. I don't know about you, Darren. Have, I, had you seen it before? I don't think, uh, well, I definitely had never seen it before. And I'm trying to remember the first time I ever heard of it. It might have been, might have been when you brought it up, but that's still well, not all that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had I've seen clips of it before, like just over years and in different programs about independent film uh, and about African American filmmakers, and you know, and and I've just read about it, and I'm like, this sounds very interesting. It looks visually, you know, just lush and. Uh, just sumptuous and looks like something I'd really enjoy. And I just never caught up with it for one reason or another. I, it's not that it's the easiest movie to find. Um, <laughs> we just talked about it earlier. We were talking about it had been streaming on Netflix, Netflix, but then all of a sudden, as I'm getting ready to go to watch it, I realize it's no longer there anymore <laughs> after I'd been on there for a long time. But I don't think it's been on Blu-ray. It, I don't know. DVD copies were hard to find of it, it seemed, for a while. But yet, yet it's been so influential for other African American and other independent filmmakers. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, do you want to describe what um, the plot of this is, or do you want me to do that? Mm, let's let's have you describe the plot or get started because what it's it's nineteen oh two. It's three generations, three generations of the family. I think four. Four. Well, oh, are we are we counting the the narrator? Also. Well, there are other little ones. Oh, that's right. Okay. There are other little ones. Like you've even got an infant. Yes, and it was set on what Saint he uh, Saint Helena Island in South Carolina. And that's where it was shot. Um, so basically, a lot of the people in the family, so this might be when you want to take over, but a lot of the people in the family, especially the younger people, uh, are talking about, or they've already decided that they're going to be leaving for the mainland from this island where they're descendant of these people that have been there f for how long? Well... It's basically there are these islands off of the coast of South Carolina and Georgia and like African kind of folk culture was and was very isolated and maintained there for like into the 20th century. And I mean, this actually occurred. And this is just kind of a, a look at that culture, um, which they call the, I believe it's pronounced Gula, Gula culture. Um, I've heard a couple different pronunciations. It depends on the accent because I've heard the Creole used in this is different than the Creole that I've heard more. I mean, because it's all peppered with different regions. I know more the kind of Louisiana to Alabama. Like, I understand, I don't understand it completely, but I understand more of it mm -hmm. than I do from, because I haven't spent as much time around South Carolina and Georgia. 
But there are parts of like Florida too, which this will come up with um, when we are talking about Zora Neale Hurston, where Creole is a little different even in parts of Florida from both, you know, the South Carolina, Georgia region, and then the, you know, other more Western region where I grew up. Yeah. It seemed, it seemed a little different from, uh, what I, I, I think the only other thing, at least full length thing that I've read by Zora Neale Hurston was the one that most, if anybody's only read one thing by her, it's prob possibly this, but what, and their eyes were watching God. Oh, and eyes are watching God. Um, yeah, well, obviously, I've read more Z Zora Neale Hurston because, as you can hear, Zora is with me right now. <laughs> I specifically named Zora Cat after Zora Neale Hurston uh, because I started reading more. I read Her Eyes Are Watching God was not the first thing of hers that I read. I read more her anthropological writings um, yeah, more of her anthropological writings, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about later. Yeah. But this movie, I guess, it it doesn't go into that territory of anthropological study, but it's a perfect time capsule, and it's, it gives this narrative of the these four generations of a of a family and the ones who were, as you were saying, this takes place in 1902, whether they're going to leave these islands and then go to mainland South Carolina or Georgia, the, what the ones, the couple of them live uh, over or have gone over to Savannah. I know they referenced that at one point, but I don't think they live there necessarily. Yeah, it's, uh, from the way she was talking about it, I don't remember if it was, uh, what, Viola? That's the Christian one, right? Yes. Uh, the one who who, ha who looks like she has the, the hairstyle that was very popular at that time that might, reminds me of Ida B. Wells. <laughs> if you've ever <laughs> seen <laughs> pictures of the... <laughs> yeah, anti uh, anti lynching journalist <laughs> Ida B. Wells. I think because she has that exact, she has that perfect, like the same style. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they did that as an homage to her. I would love it if they did, but it wouldn't surprise me. Because everything about this was very, like they had historical con consultants, they had language consultants to make sure that the language was correct. Mm. Was it? Oh, fuck. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember all the, all the people. Cause I'm usually so terrible with character names. And well, this, this was going to be one that you're just like, no, it's, you know what? There's Eli and Eula. They're, they're mm -hmm. a married couple. Nana, Nana peasant or peasant. I don't know. Yeah. I never took, French, which is the closest to Creole that I can Well, the, yeah, well, and that's just it with the Creole is that does it have more of a French or a Spanish influence with it? So to so that determines some of the pronunciation too, or Native American, yeah. like whatever language, because you have here, you have, they have part of the, the family who is mixed, I mean, Yellow Mary and what is, what's the other one? Uh, there's Yellow Mary, Viola. Who comes, who comes with her over on the boat initially? Uh, and cries when she leaves her? Was, well, oh, was the, that last child, Saint? Oh, crap. I knew I would, I know, I knew I would forget. Uh, um, Eula, uh, da, 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 Hagar, Hagar, that's the girl that married into the family. Right, uh, Viola, right. 
Iona, Mr. Sneeds, the photographer guy, uh, Saint Julian, last child, it's the Native American, right? Uh, Yellow Mary, Trula, Trula, Trula. That's what I was thinking, but I, I was, I thought it was a someone else. Sorry. She is third to last <laughs> listed in the cast. <laughs> uh, oh, she's higher in the. The other credits that I have, I'm oh, reading. Okay. Must be order of appearance, or something, because she does appear earlier in the movie. But, but, um, no, the two of them uh, are m- mixed with white, and the and there's so much with this film that you can see class and colorism kind of that takes place in this community. Um, Just these, where it's almost like these two, because they are partly white and they come back to this community that is almost exclusively dark skinned, you know, or almost exclusively like yeah considered black and it's just they're just it's an opposite kind of what you're used to seeing i mean i've seen it in some places before but um you don't have you don't often see in films communities of color portrayed as the beautiful paradise and this mainland <laughs> which granted oh there are these schools and different you know arts type things and whatever fancy you know technology that's off on the mainland but they but, don't put all the stuff in the gumbo in savannah yeah, they don't know how to do things right. They don't. They don't haven't had you know? good food in a long time, and uh, there's that asshole and it's, guy that attacked Eula. Yeah, and it's and then you see the ones who have gone to the mainland, who've become Christian essentially, and when you have these islands and more of some sort of hoodoo, um, you know, or whatever traditional religion, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you know, it's like the Christians are the weirdos here. And I kind of love that. You don't get to see that that much in film. (laughs) Yeah. The St. Christopher net necklace hangs out and I, (laughs) She's I like, really you like I Nana. You? I mean, like, I just, I know, I love <laughs> Nana. She's spunky. Yeah. Oh, I, I love how what uh, Eli bribes yeah. bribes her to stop pouting at him with chewing to chewing tobacco. Yeah. What is she said? Yeah. Oh, she's awesome. She's got that chair, like you were talking about with the uh, paradise. She just sits there in a. Mm -hmm. chair looking at forever yeah you know yeah talking about your ancestors and your spirits and sort of making fun at the saint christopher necklace and (laughs) well i just love is she the one who says we don't we don't know where the recollections come from we just know we have to remember Yes, I'm. She, I think she. I thought she said that, and I'm just. I had to write that down. I was like, <laughs> so true. They're right. They're. I mean, you, you know that you have to know so remember certain things. Yeah. You know, about behavior or about family or friendship or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. There are certain things like genuine things. 
the important of oral yeah. history on an island since, you know, there's not a lot of scrolls laying around with it written down. Well, yeah, and I, you know, and I started thinking about because Zora Neale Hurston herself did live in a community at one point, I think it was called Eatonville in Florida, that was similar where it was a, an area, I think, in the swamps that kind of was more isolated like this and it was it was all you know black or you know indigenous people who were there and lived together and there were no whites around <laughs> like it was just yeah yeah, yeah they talked about it, that and in it was that like other book. when the white yeah when the whites came there it was just kind of like no, they had no power there. They had to go through, you know, all it was like, right, of course. Like <laughs> yeah. but it was just it had maintained such this you know, like very productive, you know, culture and um for so long. And again, it was another one that was into the 20th century. Yeah. So but you have to stop and think, who is coming in and out? They have to come in and out periodically to, you know, import, export some goods, don't you think? Because I'm just... Are we talking I, about the movie again, or are we still talking about I'm talking. Bill? Sorry, no, I jumped back to the, the movie. Okay. But I mentioned the book, or in, well, Zora Neale Hurston specifically... Because she grew up like this too, kind of, or at least partially, and this isolated kind of environment. And when you're in any isolated environment, regardless of racial issues, but I'm saying that where you have, especially you're, if you're isolated by a body of water, you know, even if it is just a river or whatever, um, you're going to have to get some supplies sometimes in order to survive. And they have some really nice cloaking clothes, and I can tell they sew. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> there's some really fine fabrics in a few places. And I know I should suspend my disbelief, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious about the, you know, the incredible economy of this environment and how would they thrive for as many years as they did? And this is post, and this was 19, this was supposed to be 1902. So you're talking about, you know, post reconstruction. If it ever got there. If it, right. Did it ever, well, <laughs> they know that they, they know slavery is, you know, been abolished. And the war is over. They know that. But. Yeah. How touched were they by the war were they? I mean, I'm sure somewhat. But. I mean, somebody was probably coming for. If if they caught all of those uh, crawfish. Or how do you say it in the South? Well, no. Crawdads, no, that. Crayfish. No, that. No, that was shrimp. Okay. I wanted to. I wanted to say that big feet. That big family feast that they had. I was looking at all of that. I think I have had that same meal before, except there was no plucking of the feathers off the chicken. The chicken was already dead. I'm telling you, they had a they had a full chicken. I saw they had shrimp. Those were jumbo shrimp. And then they had crab. And yeah, I've cleaned plenty of shrimp and crab in my day. <laughs> and then they were cutting up the okra and they were cleaning the greens. Like, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> shucking the corn. I'm like, I have had that same exact meal, except I don't eat shrimp. <laughs> yeah. I liked how the one lady looked like she was cutting an onion, like she cut it in half and she was using the skin mm -hmm. as a bowl as she was just dicing it inside the onion skin i was like that's some kitchen skills there are some cooking skills there's no kitchen yeah skills. yeah 
Yeah, that's true. Well, and you know what's interesting um, about this movie is that you see the way you do see this is a society while they are isolated, they are still modern in a way. You know, they're not they're not completely shut off with their technology of like the one who's, you know, looks like I guess he's a blacksmith. You know, so oh, there has to be yeah. one they around there. They have horses. Yeah. Or, you know, he's or he's got, you know, any kind of to form any kind of tools. I mean, you know. They have a, a pretty nice set, you know, a decent setup to do that. But then they have, but there's such, it reminds me though, even with technology now, how much of, how much part of this, not just the South, I don't want to just say the South, but definitely makes me think of the South because that's what I grew up with. But, um, how agricultural this country is and we forget about it sometimes. And I mean, how it is so important uh, for certain communities, you know, it's, and it's not just how they're going about their daily lives, you know, exchanging goods or whatever but they're taking care of each other everybody takes care of each other in a way yeah uh, I mean it, it, it brings it into community as well you don't really see much of a house house type things or shelter very much except for that one part where uh wait eli is having his rage his rage tantrum right am i am i forgetting about other yeah it's no pretty, it's well, pretty out yeah. in the open you know they, they well uh, no it, that that place that is where the two of them live that's that's their home. That's that you have a lot of places like that. If you go by, there are places I know right. You just drive right along the highway mm -hmm. by new Orleans, the international airport, some places out there that out in the swamp, you will find a, a lot of it's like Cajun and there's some Creole there too. But some communities like still isolated, but it's still that close to the middle of technology and hustle and bustle. <laughs> the only time and, I drove instead of flew to New Orleans was from Alabama and it was at night and we didn't stop anywhere. So I didn't really get to see that. It. And that was that was probably a smart thing. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah. kid. No, we've well close more like in west virginia so we had we did come across a log across the road and swear we saw you know lights going on in the shanties mm. but uh anyway sorry it, what was i saying oh the way uh they they're up they're secluded oh, but not no. isolated but the uh, but the shanties is what i'm saying their their home, their structures. That's why you have storms like hurricanes and tropical storms and people just lose their homes like nothing because there are communities that have essentially, I mean, they're not the sturdiest of buildings. They're a step away from being a shed. Yeah. And... I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's, you know, when you have a storm, you <laughs> lose your home and then you have to rebuild. That is a bad thing. But 
you know, it's, I, I mean, I've seen them in other countries too. And that's what's interesting to me is that people don't think they exist in this day and age, but they do. Um, so it shows you that even now there are some isolated places, but so much is being encroached upon. I mean, it's a sh- really a shrinking area. Yeah. It's like, how many years do they say before the Everglades are going to be, you know, yeah. everything there is going to be endangered or something? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty soon, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, I know. Around the time, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, sometime around the time people realize that their neighborhoods aren't being invaded by snakes and alligators. It's the other way around. Right. Right. No, that I, I was going to say that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the movie, but I, again, <laughs> went on another tangent. Um, I'm just saying about the housing situation in the movie. I mean, also consider 1902, you know, not a lot of people had big mansions and these, I mean, they do reference something at one point that the plantations used to be over there, which, you know, makes me think that this could have been a family, a family or a group of people who were, had been slaves and, The plantation was just destroyed and these people were left to stay there with nothing, you know, no, no, like no food or, you know, resources to build anything of their own. Yeah. Which is a highly likely scenario considering what did happen to, you know, memory slaves after the at the end of the civil war but but they don't make that many references i feel to slavery in this no uh, that's part of why i kind of wondered if it didn't really get to them all that much yeah it's it's really interesting is that they're aware of it um so, I don't know, and, and it, you know, and definitely some of them are old enough to have been living or working on a plantation. Yeah. If you just go by. Nana. Right, right. Right. But... Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to say one thing about, um, uh, I had mentioned how this has been considered like really influential for different, uh, independent and, uh, filmmakers and different, uh, African American filmmakers. So if you're familiar with Beyonce, <laughs> Of course, I had to bring this up. Her entire her entire um, video album for Lemonade was inspired by this in this film. I mean, even if you look just at the vi- the video for formation, you can see a lot of the same imagery comes right from this film. Is but that, then if you see what I don't know if I'm familiar with that album. Is that the one that was when she was mad at Jay-Z? No. Whatever. Uh, okay. I'm not very familiar with the career of Beyonce. I, mean, I, <laughs> I, I know, I know You're not. The... I, color me surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was an album that people were like, oh, man, she's pissed at Jay-Z. But oh, there was there was. okay, so that does exist. 
And then if you want to, if you. This is later in her career. Okay. This was also the year that she came out um, at the Super Bowl and did this whole big, like, Malcolm X formation. That's what they're saying. It was like, she looked like a black militant. Like, that was the whole ba- right-wing backlash. It Because w- she was singing this song. <laughs> which is part of what... La- this year's Super Bowl, too. Of course, they always get mad. <laughs> Especially if it, women are involved. I mean, I, at least I should say a confident... Strong women are involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. But my point was, is that even if you're someone who only casually knows Beyonce and may, you may have seen that video, that, that one alone, there is, and, and you can, but you can see this on other videos from the, the album as well. There's so much of the imagery from this movie that just carries through. And it's it's beautiful. And I, I mean, I appreciate that. I give I give Beyonce props there. Um, you know what I mean? Because it's, yeah. you know, people say she's flighty or whatever. I'll give her props on that one. Yeah. Get it. That's a good homage or influence from something important yeah um and now was beyonce also sued by a choreographer for allegedly stealing a routine for a video was she i don't know uh that's why i made sh- made sure to put it in a question form i am not I... making a declarative statement and if you don't know it doesn't matter, but I, I... If my friend Vanessa were here, um, the one that we recorded the spook who sat by the door with, mm-hmm. um, she would know. Oh, okay. Because Vanessa just is like, yeah, she loves Beyonce. Get her drunk at a party and say, okay, Beyonce and black feminism, go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best one hour conversation you'll have. <laughs> just keep filling up the cocktail (laughs) um let's see but no this this film i love i will say that absolutely i can see why it did win that cinematography award at sundance um it's it's just got the it, it definitely has these dreamlike kind of surrealist moments without being overboard it's it's not quite as much as you know when we watched Belle du Jour <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that extreme but I you know it's more linear I feel even with the these kind of dream moments but I feel like it's you also get these images of spirits mixed in with real people. Yeah, like like Nana like Nana says, they're around they're around you. Right. I keep yeah, I pay pay paysan is how, how I see that word and that is paysan, it's probably right. Uh, anyway. I wouldn't want to emphasize it too much, lest it sound Cajun. <laughs> hey, um, or, yeah, I, but I, I I have to say I did start laughing where they had the three women. Well, two of them were sitting up in the trees, and they were you know in those nice awkward. like turn of the century. Um, long skirts and everything and they're all you know they are smoking joints <laughs> i love it yep. tell me what the spanish word for water is um I, we, like we they made were it, imp- huh they were impressed they were impressed by the concept of education 
but you you saw that this was already a culture that was very into education already. They were all thirsting for learning. So it, even whether they had someone, you know, from the outside teaching it or just from someone there already, you know, is a culture. It was just a community where you could just see like, yeah, you edu- you educate each other and that's something valued. I mean, that you know, that's one of those things that is, all, I don't know, always nice to see. And yeah, uh, this, this is sort of one of the things that, uh, that sort of pairs well with the book that we did, but uh, there's that part where Eli and Eula talk about the f- folklore about the slave uprising, mm-hmm. which is one of the only times I really think about, other than them talking about slavery being over, like we said earlier how it's not talked about that much in the movie but they're yeah doing it old school uh telling history yeah through story around a, a dinner feast right uh, absolutely one, one thing i did i think this was when they were uh getting high in the tree but uh one of the things that we haven't really we, we said that eula was attacked but uh i don't know how much we want to get in to it that part but the the one sister or the cousin said you know life's life's full of enough uncertainty you don't need to add wondering what tree your husband's hanging from yeah uh, no they i know they make reference to something like lynching so they're not that isolated yeah, well some of them are involved in the anti-lynching movement anti lynchy and- movie yeah. And right. Eli's Which, angry because Eula was raped. Right. And everybody's saying, don't, don't tell him. Don't tell him who did it. It's not going to do anything except for make life worse or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and that sort of brings in, I, I, I liked the the narrator in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the idea of how it was, and that also brings it into she's telling us a story about her family telling stories. Well, right, and you and you are absolutely right with saying that the oral tradition is part of what is so important here. You know, it's not that they're not learning you know different things but it's they don't have all these resources to produce you know all these books and that kind of thing you know and some of them may not know how to write but they can always tell stories and for a community that at least in part has been denied you know, access to educational opportunities because of, you know, racism and socio-political bullshit. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it still happens, but it's not to the same degree as it used to. So it's, I don't know. It's interesting. I I like it a lot. I it's I'm glad I I I'm glad I watched it. But it, you know what I have to say. My one criticism is that this was made in 1991, and while some of the music is cool and I can get into, some of it is so painfully 90s. <laughs> <laughs> You know exactly what I mean. Like I, movie soundtrack, kind yeah, of. <laughs> I, I was going to say that there were, yeah, there were some parts of the soundtrack that I swore I heard in a totally different movie. It just seemed like, yeah, 
like a copy paste. But yeah, some of the other stuff, like I like the the woodwinds, you know, sort of yeah. dan- dancing, oh. especially on the beach scenes and stuff. Mm hmm. Uh, that, that was that was one thing that stood out. What were you gonna say? No, no, you're right. I, I mean, it's definitely, uh, and the use. I mean, obviously, the use of African instruments in with different modern Western ones, but uh, I mean, and I you wouldn't expect considering the rest of the movie. I would be surprised if that weren't on the soundtrack hmm. in some capacity. Yeah. That I would find that I would find that a strange choice, but, um, yeah. So yeah, my, like I said, my only complaint is just to have those few moments where you're like, Ooh, nineties. <laughs> yeah. Oh Yeah. <laughs> Almost a hundred years after where it was set, or when it was set, not where it was exactly where it was set, but no, it's what it's been over a hundred years well, since then, when this was set in ninety one. Yeah. It was almost a hundred years. Oh yeah, later. yeah, uh, yeah. I I I also purchased this digitally because I didn't really. See, uh, I mean, <laughs> there were a couple, you know, $40 for the DVD or something like that. I was like, nah. And so I, I purchased it legitly, legitimately. Yeah. And I, I watched it twice because it was a little hard to follow some of the conversations the first time through just because I wasn't as used mm-hmm. to the dialect. Uh, so, well, I had read the book first. The the one with so Tony, I... Tony Kade Bambara. No, no, no. Oh, no. The um, no. I'm saying the uh, Zora Neale Hurston book. Oh, okay. That we're getting ready to talk about. Oh, okay. I, I, I had thought... read that <laughs> before I watched this movie, so I was already in the mindset of the language. Um, and I read the book right away. <laughs> and okay. So there was a bit of a gap, but anyway, we can save save that for then. I just interrupted you again. That's okay. Um, but so I, I, and I then so then the next was it two days later or a day later? Um, uh, two days later. No, a day later. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't remember. Um, I watched the movie, and so I was already in the mindset still of the language. But also, yes, I'm used to some of the some of the accent, and I and there is some of the slang that is still used down south. Mm-hmm. Some of it at one point was more derogatory now, not so much. And, you know, then there's some that it always depends on the intent behind it and who's saying it, you know, um, but you got the whole, yeah. Um, as I was saying, um, so yeah, I, there's so much that I've heard over the years, especially traveling around South, the South, like I have. Um, and I mean, in addition to just living where I lived down South, I traveled in enough parts of it, but like I was saying, South Carolina and Georgia, I don't know as well as other parts of the South. Which, interestingly enough, I didn't plan it that way, but it seems like the book talks more about Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana. Not so much, like, even Georgia. (laughs) (laughs) 
it, I'm, I wasn't planning to like spread out the, you know, and cover the, the way that cover the geography of the American Southeast, yeah. but <laughs> with the, with these different, you know, um, stories that we're covering, but uh, that's kind of what happened. But um, is there anything else that w- you would like to say about the movie? I think it's a good movie. I think you shouldn't try watching it when you're tired because it is a it is a movie that could easy easily let you list carry on those woodwinds into a sleepy time. Yeah, some of that is really soothing. Yeah. But some uh, is very soothing. There's a lot of substance in the slow and steady in in this movie and it is kind of what it is. How long is it? Almost two hours. Yeah. There was a, there. There was one point I will say where I kind of was like, okay, this could be a little bit shorter, but it was because I was getting sleepy. <laughs> that See? was my only thing. Yeah, that, that was the only... It was probably the la- It was only the last 10 minutes of the movie, though. I, I knew it was wrapping up. I just was like, oh, I, it all of a sudden hit me, though, that I was really tired. <laughs> <laughs> and I had been enjoying the movie, so, yeah. But anyway, go ahead. I interrupted you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a unique story that I, I have not really seen in another movie, so... Yeah, it's a recommend, but maybe rent before you buy if you're not already sold and you somehow listen to this whole thing and haven't seen it yet. Yeah, and you know the way that it's presented to this this story is there's certain elements of it that because they are this kind of dreamlike atmosphere or this kind of utopia kind of otherworldly place. So it's definitely got a different feel. Um, I would definitely recommend it, but I know there are certain people who couldn't sit through it because it is, it does have those dreamlike moments. Oh, I do. You know, a, I do have a question though, before we transition, sure. we take a break and go into the book, but sure. Uh, offhand, do you know if anybody ever turned this into a play? I, I feel I don't know if you could do that on an inside sort of thing, but it, an outdoor play, it seems mm. sort of like I, I had I found found myself wondering in the watching because it is a lot of scene, 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 and not a lot of uh, straight transition travel. You know, it's guys walking yeah. down the path. There's Eli and Nana sort of in the enclosed area doing the advice and the talk. And then there's the tree and there's the. So, yeah, I was just wondering if it sounds like it. Oh, yeah, was, you could do completely. No, it, well, I don't think it's been a play, but that would completely work as a play. I'm completely I'm already thinking of the staging in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I've Coming got this plan out. <laughs> sorry yeah wow no actually because you you just a, a minimal set i mean truthfully yeah. you don't need much of anything as far as a set goes but you could do some great things with with lighting and um sound design yeah because the writing is so strong, truthfully. And it's such a good ensemble piece. I really, f- you know, you definitely have some people who have more screen time. But it's an ensemble piece. Yeah. And I think that's part of why I enjoyed it. So, you know. And it's it's interesting because it is so female driven too. Yes. I mean, it's not that the men aren't important characters in here. They are, but I feel that they take a secondary role. 
Yeah, although, you know, Eli's working through his uh, macho madness or whatever, you know, and Nana puts him in his place. Right. Oh, that was a really good line. Like, you can't get back what you never owned. She didn't sell herself to you. She married you or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. When he says my wife yeah. and he's my like. My wife. Some, some yeah. guy. Yeah. When he's. I mean, understandably upset, but. Right. Yeah. You know, he's talking but about I me, love, me, me, me. I love me. the way that. She, <laughs> but I love the way. Yeah. She puts him in his place. Oh, saying that. Oh. Yeah. But, but yeah, think, so that's, that's a recommend from me, too. <laughs> yeah, I think that was covered it pretty well. And still, I mean, we tossed some spoilers in there, but I think that we, yeah. there's so much I more did, of the movie that we didn't. There is more that we could definitely talk about, but I don't. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. That's true. I'd like to leave something up to the imagination. Yeah. Uh, we did back in the up. box spoilers. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. On that note, um, let's take a short break and then we will be back to discuss our book. Be back. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. Okay, and we're back. Um, yeah, we're back with the Zora Neale Hurston book, Every Tongue Gotta Confess. And um, Darren... How um, you mentioned you'd read some Zora Neale Hurston before everything. Uh, when did you, when were you introduced to that? I'm just curious. College. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh shit! It was a. I think it was an African American literature class, or a. Uh, literature class from the the time period i had some cool professors that you know always found a way to make uh tony morrison or uh zora neale hurston or jack kerouac to show up whenever they felt like it um, yeah see it's interesting i I've, I've thought about it before just i always think about it whenever you talk about books that you read in school <laughs> and i'm like Nope, I never read that book in school. I had to come to it by myself much later because my school, not that my school sucked, but it was very traditional in some of it and safe in some of its, like, literary choices. <laughs> in college or high school? Both. Okay. <laughs> Both. And the, I mean, I, to tell you the truth... Like the only African American, this is really sad to say, but I did, I w did go to college in Alabama, um, even though it was the first college in Alabama to integrate, doesn't mean much of anything. Um, we only, there was only, I guess, two yeah, two African-American 
or black um, writers that we ever read. Toni Morrison and then James Baldwin. Okay. Well, so, I mean, that's some good stuff. No, but, yeah, absolutely. But it, yeah, but that's it's all like we read. The top stuff. Um, yeah. As, yeah, as oh, if there, who, there's not anything else. And I... I at least did start reading Alice Walker on my own. I mean, isn't that when you come out of the closet as a lesbian in college? <laughs> isn't it? Don't you have to start reading and your and your you know an art minor? You have to start reading you know about you know feminism and <laughs> and all of that. So you have to start reading Alice Walker. <laughs> it's a, it's a given. <laughs> um. But <laughs> that was what I did that on my own. But it's interesting that it's sad that my school didn't they didn't offer that when I don't know. I've always loved Zora Neale Hurston once I found her. And it, what, part of why I mean, she was kind of hidden for so long Uh she didn't have, live a, a super long life, but she, you know, and what it, a lot of what she had was these essays, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, part, she, partly, you know, she was an anthropologist, not just an author, but um, there was so much of it that, that she relied on these just because she wasn't, she got so into the anthropological uh, study and I mean, research kind of type things, even after she graduated college, I mean, she just, you know, be, was so reliant still on patrons the same way as a, a student for, you know, for so many years of her life. And so much of her work was hidden away in these private collections and nobody saw them until someone died. And, and a lot of that ended up being, I guess the 60s and 70s and Alice Walker is part of the reason we know who Zora Neale Hurston is. Um, she actually bought her a headstone uh, where she was buried. And um, yeah, which is kind of, that's takes where, you know, sometimes you have to do this research to find what out, you know, what out, what's out there and kind of what you're missing <laughs> and what the world needs to know. So that's, I don't know. That's why I felt I, 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 I kind of wanted to do a Zora Neale Hurston book and I wasn't sure what book we were going to choose. Um, I didn't know if we wanted to go, you know, traditional, their eyes are watching God but then I and I've read a lot of different others, but I have still a few that I, of course, that I haven't read. So I kind of like I let you choose this one, which I was kind of excited about. Uh, how um, what did you what did you think about this, Darren? This book? Yes, I really liked this book. Um, yeah. Uh, this this one I went through the audiobook. Oh really? And, yeah, and it's read by Ozzy Davis and uh, Ruby D. Oh my goodness! Yes, it's I listened to it twice. I think <laughs> it's just si sitting there, and Ozzy Davis and Ruby D are reading these reading these. Folk tales, which uh, you know, this is Zora Neale Hurston, the like the doing her folklore stuff, like we talked about, traveling through the Gulf states in the late twenties, collecting all these folk tales and stories about, you know, mistaken identity, and you know, I knew a man so blank or a woman so blank, and stories about God and Satan, and it's just. Ugly tales and things yeah. and animal tales. And and it's interesting that these were coming from 
what I, what did I say? There were Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana. And there were some of those stories that I still, I heard variations of growing up. Oh, so cool. You should, that you should there's, totally check out the audiobook if you... Uh... Like in the 70s when I was a kid, <laughs> when I moved down there, I, like, I, I would still hear people tell some, you know, certain stories and it's, it, you know, of course there are variations because as time goes on, things vary. And also every group of people is going to tell theirs differently or whatever. But then, yeah, it, uh, it's interesting. Well, it there was, were uh, some that were almost verbatim word for word from different people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, this this book... <laughs> to be honest, well, I was I had a vague idea of what Daughters of, in the, of the Dust was about, and I was just looking at Zora Neale Hurston's stuff. I was like, maybe this one will work. So, yeah. But I mean, I love this stuff. I love folklore and folk tales and stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. oral oral history and mythology. You know, it reminds me of stuff. One of the things I did when I worked at the folklore department at school was uh yeah. organizing old uh ethnographies and stuff that uh folk folklorists and people did and turned in for their theses because they were <laughs> there were so I many know. ones still on paper. Well and Zora Neale Hurston, I mean specifically her folklore that she covered was African American and Caribbean folklore. And I've I mean I've read, I've read one of the first things of hers that I read was some of her m more Caribbean folklore. And, um, uh, that's pretty interesting too. But then this community, I mean, some of these kind of tales, you know, you feel there are certain things that, and stories that carry a little bit. Uh, just, it's just, again, like I was saying, different place, different region, whatever. <laughs> There's certain, you know, everyone's got their version of your mama's so fat kind of joke, <laughs> whatever it is, your mama's so ugly, <laughs> like whatever stupid thing it is, every group of people's got certain little, you know, crazy tall tales in these oral traditions. And I just love hearing them and some of these you can tell were told with such joy and it reminds me of like if, if you were just sitting around with a group of family members or friends and you're all just whatever you've been hanging out for a while and you just get to going and you're just cracking each other up yeah, trying to trying to do better each turn yeah, completely trying to outdo each other. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised that I had, I, I don't know about surprised, but that I hadn't got to this sooner. Yeah, this was a first read mm -hmm. for me. Well, same for me. This had been sitting on my bookshelf, but I hadn't opened it yet. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a couple of those that uh, that I haven't, you know, opened up yet. Uh, but there's one in here I have to point out. The Mobile Disaster. There's a specific Mobile, Alabama one in here. Oh. It's a super short one, and it makes me giggle. In a stupid way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a corny joke. It is such a perfect corny joke. And it's okay. The mobile disaster. Have you heard about the wreck? Dolphin run into Royal up Royal street, skint up St. Francis street, Conti laying at the pain, at the point of death. Now, excuse my poor reading of that, but 
the way it is, there's all downtown Mobile <laughs> is right there, described right there. And the way those streets kind of intersect. And they're actually a good way to, like, people have gotten in wrecks around there. Like, but it's just a corny way of pointing out that that's an intersection where, or, you know, that's an area that has wrecks because there's a lot of traffic. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just, you know, it's something that simple, but it's, yeah. And the animal tales. It's true. kind of like, what's, you know, what's black and white and red all over? <laughs> what's red all over? A newspaper, you know? Yeah. Like saying corny little jokes like that. <laughs> And they were just delightful. I like the story of how the rattlesnake got the rattle. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's... St- yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Ozzie Davis tells that one. If you ever get to that. I might have to pick that up. I I certainly like um, Ozzie Davis and Ruby D. And, you know, I... Were they married when they did Do the Right Thing? Yeah. I I have since I found out that they were married, I haven't seen Do the Right Thing. And I wanna watch their interactions with that knowledge. Oh, they've been married since the sixties. I believe. Like they were marching together back um uh, yeah, back with Martin Luther King. <laughs> <laughs> they seriously were <laughs> yeah I was going to do a beleaguered Bubba Hotep reference and say ever since the CIA filled his head with sand and stuck him in that nursing home I, in Texas I know I love him so much on that <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean it's just what 500 600 f- stories that she collected. And that, yeah, go ahead. And that sounds like a lot, but it's not. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> there's so many that it's it's hard to really describe it. Yeah, there's well, the in, sections. There's the you know, there's the animal stories, there's the God and the devil stories, there's the man so, woman so, night so, people so <laughs> uh I have what you know. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I have a hard copy of it. I mean, I have a paperback. And it's 275 pages, give or take. And, um, yeah, there, it, you can read it in short spurts if you want to pick it up and put it down. It's perfect for that kind of thing. Yeah. I, you know, it's better than doing a short, doing short stories, I will say. But I like the way that they're kind of grouped. She grouped them together. Also, it I don't know exactly all what the editor did, but there has been some work done with that. But apparently Hurston had already organized a lot of things in a certain order. Um. Like she regularly did that, did that with her work, even things of hers that were like unpublished, yeah, and that people even that people have found like years later, just stuffed in boxes or whatever. <laughs> she was very meticulous with the way she organized it. Yeah, she she's one of the she actually, when you say she worked in anthropology. She worked with Margaret Mead, which, you know, Margaret Mead is like one of those names I think everybody knows uh, if you talk about anthropology. (laughs) (laughs) Even if you don't know anthropology. (laughs) That's how I feel about Margaret Mead. Like Jane Goodall. (laughs) Right, exactly. But um, still, I, I mean... The I mean, just the stories about how these patrons 
would pay her to, you know, go on these collect these basically folklore collecting trips and, you know, pay for her to go down, spend time in whatever communities and live down there for however long (laughs) as she just collected stories and stories after stories. And you'll notice in, if you get the book, uh, that like a, a hard copy of it is that they, there are some of the stories that it's even noted. Oh, in another edition of folk tales, this same story was told. <laughs> it was just attributed to someone else. <laughs> and, you know, they'll find like, okay, so and so plagiarized so and so, and they'll make the they'll point it out that the way things have been attributed to certain people, or the way that you know someone has stolen credit for, like, oh, this really happened to me when really it happened to your neighbor. You know, everybody knows someone like that who steal, you know, steals the story. <laughs> right. Exactly. Steal they the just jokes. And, mm-hmm. Exactly. So uh I just find I just that's part of what I find wonderful about this because it it makes them feel so rich. Uh Because it's like you want to know, it makes, even though these are just little bits and pieces of stories from people. And I'm sure if you go through here, there are some that are repeated. Like some people have told more than one story in here. Just different categories, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. they'll, they'll They'll sometimes throw out the story credit in the audiobook version and there were a couple names mm-hmm. that I heard a lot of times. Right. Well, and yeah, and the way it's credited in the I mean like there's the the appendix in their multiple appendix um uh, in uh the hardback I mean the the copy I have because it gives the locations where these were recorded, like these sections of uh, the book. And and then it gives certain ones from, you know, whatever person. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so you can find it, which so I like that it gives the locations, though, too. Kind of gives and it gives you in a brief description of like what kind of industry or economic me, you know, culture was important in a specific city or community where you're collecting this group of stories. Like what she mentions Mobile. Mobile talks about the different industries there, both agricultural and technological that were productive at the time. Of the you know the 1920s and 30 early 30s when she was collecting these stories, so it's kind of interesting though. Some of it when I'm like, oh, nah, it's nice to see that hasn't changed. Because <laughs> 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 you hear about everything changing so much in the world, <laughs> you're like, and then you're also like, mm, there's also that point of, are those people behind the times? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Depends on how you want to look at it. Depends on no comment. It was but at the time you are. And what you're looking for. Right. As far as what you're looking to achieve. But I don't know where I was going with that. But it's just uh like I said, I just thought it was I, I, I think it's interesting with the two bring in the locations and I mean, it makes sense. Um, if you're going through specific areas, I mean, you have to document 
the location. But very that that's one of the I mean you gotta do that when you're doing folkloric research. I she might might not have necessarily been doing it uh purposefully that that scientific but the their organization yeah. just is key. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. Uh, but it's it's something that, you know, uh like a, a writer that would go into studying folklore or something might not think of, but uh, mm-hmm. a writer coming out of it, it's just second nature. Well, and that's just it. I mean, she went to, she actually went to school for anthropology. You know, she went to, like, she went to Barnard. Um uh, Where she was, I mean, the only black student. And, you know, she got her BA in anthropology. But, so it was like she was really studying the anthropology, but she was really a writer. Because she was right, she was still just writing. Mm -hmm. Like even fiction. I mean, I think she did write some poetry too. I mean, she was, and I know, I've read that she's, you know, made film too, but I haven't seen much of it. I haven't read or seen much else about that, you know, so, I mean, it just could be part of it is that over time something's been destroyed and there's no way to see what, you know, just wasn't preserved because, like I said, she didn't even have a headstone where she was buried. So who knows what condition everything was left in. <laughs> yeah, she didn't necessarily do everything preserving it for centuries of posterity. She was just doing it because right. of what she was doing. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah. Well, and it was that time period too because, I mean, if she was, I mean, she was... You know, she ran in the circles of, you know, the Harlem Renaissance and is considered, I guess, part of that. But she doesn't fall into a box as strict as, you know, as some of the other, like, writers of the Harlem Renaissance because of the anthropology that she did. You know, which, you know, makes her, I think, a, a, a more interesting writer. Because the anthropological work, it it just, I, I don't know, it's more readable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it comes across as less academic. And I'm saying that from reading, having read other books of hers that are, more anthropological and maybe in other writers hands that same subject matter would have come off completely differently if they were just an anthropologist but she you know she was definitely gifted in another way and she knows she knows language and she and she has a great way of capturing it on paper. Well, and even from what you're saying, the audiobook. I'm it, you know, it's there's a certain amount of it that is definitely conversational. Yeah. That's but cool. many writers don't know how to capture conversational dialogue or descriptions of things for that matter. Yeah. Well, did, do you think, uh, she did any audio recordings and she was writing from that? I don't know. That's an interesting question. That, that would possibly have been something that, 
because you, you said she went to school for anthropology. Uh, well, I know audio would... recording devices weren't, you know, super prevalent. Yeah. But... I mean, okay. I mean, she, let's see. She was going to Barnard when she, in, uh, hold on. She graduated Barnard in 28 when she was 37. Okay. But so she would have at least. Yeah. Started working then. And I mean, she died in 1960. So, how did she die? Um, you know, I don't remember. Hold on a second. Oh, she had a stroke. And she had heart disease. Yeah. Yep. So, there you have it. Um, <laughs> there, there we have it. Yeah, I totally recommend this book. I don't... I'm bringing the energy back up. We we we're not going out Sorry. on a bummer. <laughs> no, I just I kind of got distracted. Sorry, and I'm also, yeah, I'm also a little tired now. But I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going out trying to be a bummer. No, absolutely not. Go Her ahead, Darren. Sad. Her art is great. Totally recommend Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, I do too. Yeah. Obviously, I I recommend her, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like I said, this is nice because, and some of her other things too, but this particularly has some nice little short tidbits. So it is easy to just pick up and put down, pick up, put down, whatever. You know, so you could fit it in whenever you have an opportunity. You know, that's because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't have time to finish something. But this would be a good thing, I think, that um, could fit into people's just whenever. <laughs> Those little squished moments of your schedule, you know. Yeah. I think that was a good combination. Uh, yeah. Is there anything we should say before we say what our next combination is? You know, I can't think of anything. Um, no, I think I'm, I think I'm good. But so next month, of course, it is that time of year again. We need to have like some sort of horrible, obnoxious sports anthem playing in the background, but we're not going to because of licensing issues. <laughs> um, we, um, it, it's coming up again. It is that time of year. It is the madness of March. Yes, March yeah. madness. March madness. March madness. And this time around, I think we. I mentioned we were interested in doing it before, but we are going to be doing Summer of Sam. Yes. The uh, Spike Lee movie. This will be the second time you and I have covered Spike Lee, by the way, Darren. It will be. Not for here. I mean, the other time was for Psycho Semantic Cast, but. Collectively. Collectively. And we just spoke, noted. Or, yeah. Hmm? Just noting that, though. Yeah, if you're looking for it in the in the uh, the backlog of episodes, look over there. Yeah, and 
we but, talked um, about do the right thing a little bit earlier, and I feel like we just randomly talk about Spike Lee movies. So, I yeah, it was an effort. I yeah, exactly. So um, we're going to be doing that, and we are going to be reading Mine Hunter by John E. Douglas and Mark Oslinger. I think. I think that's his last name. I'm. I think it's Olshunker, but I, I can't. Didn't take German either, which that's what that sounds. John E. Douglas. <laughs> John E. Douglas. The. Uh, yeah. That the um, Netflix kind of miniseries is loosely, well, it's inspired by, based on, kind of combination. Yeah, every, every once in a while, I don't know if you've started reading it yet, but every once in a while it's like, oh, okay, yeah, and then it goes back into s- s- unfamiliar stuff to me. Well, I've read it before. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, so I'm just, but this time I'm doing the audio book instead of, oh, yeah. Who does the audio book? I don't know, oh, some guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure he's someone, somebody knows, but I don't know him. I mean, sometimes it's Sir Ian McKellen reading The Odyssey, and sometimes it's yeah. some guy reading Mindhunter. I mean, and I'm fine with that, but, you know, anyway. To be discussed later, but <laughs> no, we're going to discuss the book. Not who reads the book? Um, anyway, yes. So those are, um, and that's what we're going to be uh, doing next month. And hopefully, we will have a surprise guest. But anyway, um, do you have anything else to talk? What's going on with Psycho Semanticast or any other show you might? be on Darren <laughs> well right now yeah over uh, Psycho Semantic today recording so it's definitely already out I just put uh, Murder at 1600 episode out with uh, our friend Lance um, if you mm-hmm. don't know Murder at 1600 it is a 1997 Wesley Snipes Diane Lane murder crime action drama <laughs> with Dennis Miller and uh, Bobby Cox Bobby Cox president oh Alan Alda so anyway all these people in a really yeah. weird movie and then okay. um, I've, you know, I've seen it but I barely remember it it's it's one of those movies that came out that all, half the stuff in the trailer isn't in the movie um, but yeah, we, we talked about that and there's a little bit of a primary talk and, uh, but mostly we actually kept it largely close to the movie or tangents that sprung from it. And, mm-hmm. uh, all, of course with March coming up, uh, we will psycho semantic will continue our celebration of purge day, which is in March, um, uh, with covering one or two more of the Purge movies. I've done the first two so far. Mm. It's, it's a tradition. Just like the Purge, it's not necessarily the best thing to do, but it's being done. I actually kind of like those movies. Yeah, I mean, they're straight up my alley. They're po- super fucking political, and then they're yeah, no. killing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 It's it's no, my I, Sharknado I, or you know, but I think yeah. it's a little bit better than Sharknado, but so Oh, it's a lot better than Sharknado. Yeah. Uh, so doesn't mean it's great, but it's a lot better <laughs> than Sharknado. Yeah. So yeah, that and who knows, you know, I try not to book too far in advance with that because you never know what the fuck's happening. But Yeah. It's an election year, so I've got a giant list of election adjacent movies that might get hit. Just, but yeah, uh, for us as VD Clinic Pod in most places, if you're looking for us, it seems like you've already found us a little bit if you're hearing my voice. But yeah, uh, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you for your time. 
we should probably go. I know we both got some things to yeah. do. But until then, until we speak again. Yes. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, listeners. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at vdclinicpod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more.